Thank you all. Um, so we're approaching actually the second segment and the way we thought how to transition from one segment to another is by having a transition talk. Uh, so I'm very much looking forward to Justin Reich's uh, presentation, which is a transition presentation. I think one of the topics coming out of the first segment or common themes, I should say, that we will revisit certainly in, in the second uh, segment this afternoon and more on that just in a few minutes, is how much context matters. Uh, I think we already started with that uh, in, in our early morning presentations. Uh, the context of learning, the context of education matters, the context in which technology is used matters ultimately for the success and for the impact of open resources on education. Justin Reich will focus on one particular aspect uh, of where context matters, and that's when open encounters different classrooms. Uh, and we're really looking forward to it, Justin. Justin is um, a fellow at the Berkman Center, among many other things. Uh, he recently finished his dissertation at the uh, Graduate School of Education here at Harvard uh, and is leading uh, fantastic efforts, uh, also working closely with teachers. The EdTech uh, initiative is among the projects he's working on. Uh, and thanks for being here and transitioning us. Sure, thank you. Um, so I'm going to start with a mutually beneficial, shameless plug. Um, so I have a blog, EdTech Researcher, which just got picked up by Education Week, and so I'm going to be publishing from that platform. Um, all of you build and research amazing things, and when you do cool stuff, um, you should let me know, and then I'll write it up, and then that's hopefully one way um, that people who are interested in communicating with education leaders can uh, have one more platform to do that with. So if you, um, I just started on Monday, um, so come and visit, but also uh, let me know what you're up to so that I can uh, write about it and share it with other folks. Um, so my task is to serve as an inflection point between a morning of thinking systemically um, about the OER system um, and then an afternoon of thinking about specific case studies. So when I think about thinking systemically, um, I think about building a conceptual model, um, a simplification of reality that offers us some kind of conceptual clarity. Um, and what I think case studies are really good for um, is introducing a kind of empirical messiness, um, introducing uh, particular details particular context that forces us to go back to the conceptual models we build um, and rethink them in different ways and figure out what kinds of pieces we should add and subtract. Um, so I'm going to tell you one story today about a case that I have been looking deeply into and how it sort of shaped and transformed um, the model of OER that I have in my own head um, as an example of the way that we might approach the work that we do together this afternoon. Um, so here's just a little schematic of the OER ecosystem as we've described it uh, and challenged it this morning. Um, but there's a group of folks who consider themselves builders and suppliers who create um, resources and platforms and aggregators and other kinds of things. Um, for the most part, they depend upon the internet as a distribution mechanism. Um, and they imagine on the other side of the series of tubes, um, there being two populations of interests, a, a group we've identified as facilitators and a group that we've identified as learners. Um, and the idea is that people create these OER, whatever they are, um, and they pass through the tubes of the internet, and they arrive uh, in the brains of young learners either directly or indirectly through some kind of facilitator. Um, and then what I think is really cool and really promising and, and exciting is that we can imagine, um, because of the nature of our resources, a kind of two-way interaction when, when that OER arrives in the brains of young learners, um, we can watch how they're using it and measure that. We can wrap those things in paradata, um, and we can pass that back through the internet and pass it back to the builder so that there's kind of an iteration um, that's able to happen in, in development. Um, if you wanted a, a simple schematic of how the morning was laid out, that's my kind of really basic schematic. Um, at the risk of running over my time, I'll pause already to say that I think there have been some really great challenges um, to that schematic that have been brought up by some cases that we've looked at already. So, so things that I heard, um, particularly from Vicky and her discussion of the flat classroom project and John and her discussion of the flipped classroom model, is this notion that we have three distinctive groups um, is really problematic. The idea that there are builders passing things to learners um, doesn't make a lot of sense unless we, you know, if we don't want to imagine facilitators and learners as consumers, if we want to imagine them as co-constructors of their own learning experiences, um, then maybe the whole supply and demand model is something that we could think about shifting and changing. Um, but that's not what I'll talk about, because I just heard about it this morning. I'll talk about things that I've been um, digging into for the past four years. Um, 
Oh, oh, let me say one more thing about this. So there's a pretty simple um, model that underlies all this, which is that as open education resources innovation happens, um, the ideal result is at least in some linear way learning improves. Um, that the number of neurons and young brains that are reorganized for pro-social purposes is greater um, as innovation improves. So that, this is the kind of simplest possible schematic. Um, so the Hewlett Foundation, um, so the Hewlett Foundation for the last four years um, has funded my research into wikis um, and how, not mass media wikis, but how classroom wikis are used in different kinds of settings. Um, and what that has made me very attentive to um, is the ways in which um, these, this schematic might look differently um, if you imagine uh, it working in profoundly inequitable school systems. Um, so one of the distinctive features of the United States, and this isn't the case everywhere, is that we have a profoundly inequitable school system. So we talked a little bit yesterday about the idea that, uh, um, you know, that, that the United States is kind of in the middle of the pack of OECD countries. Um, but if you disaggregate that data by wealthy and poor students, what you find is that our wealthy students um, perform as well as, as uh, good schools all around the world, um, and the results, you know, the, out the educational outcomes for students in low incomes, homes, and families is shameful and embarrassing. Um, so for me, one of, the, one of the signature features that's come out of my research um, is rethinking this schematic um, to take account profoundly inequitable school systems. So what I wanted to do um, is show you the kind of amendment that I've made to this kind of general schematic um, and talk about how I think wikis sort of illustrate um, the importance of thinking about uh, the importance of thinking about how all of the stuff, all the work we do operates in profoundly inequitable school systems. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna make one really simple conceptual move, which is that um, I still imagine that there are a whole group of builders. I still imagine that there's a internet, which is the kind of distribution mechanism. Um, but on the far side of the internet, I think it's really useful in a simple way just to imagine that you have two parallel systems, um, one serving low-income uh, facilitators and learners and one serving um, really affluent uh, facilitators and learners. So there's the $9 million um, science building that was just built at the Deerfield Academy, which is my um, alma mater. Um, but the hope um, is that OER is built by builders and it passes through a neoliberal democratizing internet um, and it travels into both of these environments um, relatively equitably and people benefit. Um, and we could actually tell two kinds of stories about the results of that OER passing to these different kinds of environments. So one kind of story that we could hypothesize um, is that uh, in the beginning, we expect there to be disparities in learning outcomes for affluent and low-income students because we live in a profoundly inequitable society. Um, but affluent students already have access to all kinds of proprietary tools, resources, platforms, aggregators, all kinds of stuff. Um, and so we, we build a bunch of openly accessible and freely accessible stuff. Um, it disproportionately benefits low-income students because they now have access to a whole wide variety of things that their more affluent peers have had access to for a long time. Um, we might call that the closing gap scenario. Um, another scenario you might imagine is that, again, we start with sort of a, a disparity based on society. Um, but in fact, for a wide variety of reasons, um, students in affluent homes and schools have a greater degree of um, social capital, human capital, technical capital in those kinds of institutions um, that allow them to take up and take advantage of OER resources more easily, uh, more profitably, um, with greater efficacy that can happen in uh, schools and learning environments serving low-income students. And so actually what happens is that the widespread availability of freely available resources ends up disproportionately benefiting those who are already affluent. Um, that when you take a bunch of stuff and you just kind of put that stuff out there, institutions with greater capacity take it up faster. Um, and so the technology serves as an accelerant of inequities that already exist in our society. So we could call that the rising tide scenario from the, you know, the sort of famous Rawlsian phrase, a rising tide lifts all boats. Um, that I'm not saying that anyone is harmed in this scenario, um, but a rising tide lifts all boats, but the mega yachts get lifted higher than the dinghies do. Um, <coughs> so... Um, it was this case study of wikis that helped me think about this and frame this, and let me tell you a little bit of the data that I found um, about how wikis are used in different settings. So I, I study um, wikis that are produced on a platform called PBWorks, um, so they're not, uh, it's not Wikipedia, it's not mass media wikis, it's wikis that teachers create for a particular purpose or students create or small groups of learners create 
Um, one thing that's awesome about studying cases in our field is that the range of data available to study any given case is you know, mind-alteringly fascinating and exciting. Um, so I had a chance to draw from a population of over a quarter of a million um, publicly viewable education-related wikis that have been created on PBWorks. And, for every, you know, and you all know this, for every one of those wikis, um, I had the entire edit history that we were able to examine um, where we could look at every interaction between every teacher and student um, in those kinds of environments. Um, and this is all um, just recently published in Educational Researcher in a, in a paper called The State of Wiki Usage in U.S. K-12 Schools. Um, and one of the central questions that we asked was, does wiki usage differ in schools serving different populations? Um, so one of the things that we did was we developed an instrument um, to measure the degree to which wikis provide opportunities for students to develop deeper learning competencies like expert thinking, complex communication, and new media literacy. Um, and we applied that instrument um, to a sample of wikis that was randomly drawn from this whole population. So we have hundreds of thousands of wikis, we draw a random sample, um, and uh, we identify in particular wikis that are used in US K-12 public schools. So we can measure the kinds of learning opportunities that students have on these wikis, and we can correlate those learning opportunities and that quality measure um, with socioeconomic status data from the public schools, which is well kept in the United States from the Common Core of Data. Um, so in a short talk, I'm giving you a, a pretty brief summary of this, but let me give you sort of one slide of data about this. Um, so one way to slice the sample of wikis that we looked at is to put them in four categories. Um, one category is failed or trial wikis. So these would be wikis that like say hello world across the top and they're never changed again or welcome to Mr. Reich's world history class and that's the last edit you see. Um, another kind of wiki would be teacher-centered content delivery wikis. So this is instead of handing out my syllabus to you at the beginning of the year, I put my syllabus in a wiki and I put some links and things like that. But there's no student interaction in the learning environment. It's just a one-way content delivery device. A third category of wikis would be individual student-owned wikis. So you could imagine that if you assigned me to write a paper about Hamlet, instead of handing you that paper on a piece of paper, I post it on a wiki page and put on some links and put on some images and so forth. Or maybe you asked me to maintain a portfolio of my work across a year or multiple years. Um, and then the last category of wikis is kind of what we imagine wikis to be, which would be collaborative student-owned wikis. So this would be topical encyclopedias or AP history reviews or collaboratively produced choose-your-own-adventures. Um, so one interesting question to ask is how does the distribution of wikis in these four categories differ between low-income schools and mid- to high-income schools? And for those of you who are familiar, I'm, I'm using the Title I status as the, distinguish, uh, the distinguishing feature here. Um, so what you find... Um, the most relevant piece for this talk is that wikis created in low-income schools um, are significantly more likely to end up in the failed or trialed category um, than wikis that are created in wealthy schools. Um, and wikis uh, created in mid- to high-income schools are much more likely to fall into this individual student-owned wiki category where we actually have students who are doing the creation, doing the, um, you know, the, the, the development of new media skills, the, the development of performances of understanding. Um, it's sort of a tune for another time that actually only about one or two percent of wikis end up being used actually is what we imagine wikis being um, as collaborative uh, learning environments. Um, but it, but it was, it, it, you know, this is a brief view but a powerful to me um, that essentially wikis are significantly more likely to provide opportunities for deeper learning um, if they're created in schools serving uh, mid to high income students. Um, Another thing that we measured along the way was sort of how long these wikis persisted. So what was the length of time between the very first change and the very last change? Um, the median lifetime of wikis created in low-income schools is about six days. The median lifetime of wikis created in mid- to high-income schools is about 33 days. Um, so not only do students have more opportunities with wikis that are created in mid- to high-income schools, um, but they persist longer, and so you know, presumably those, those opportunities persist longer as well. Um, so if we go back to our schematic, um, you know, what, what one, way to, one way to visualize this is that we have PBWorks wikis that are created by builders, and it's, you know, this, or the platform is created by a builder, passes through the internet, and makes its way relatively easily into high-income schools. Um, but for a wide variety of reasons, of technological, social, pedagogical reasons, um, the, the platform stumbles in making its way into high-income schools. Um, so in, in schools serving low-income uh, families or low-income neighborhoods, there's more test pressure. Teachers have more students per teacher. They have fewer prep periods. They have more classes they teach. Um, they have fewer curriculum supports available to them at a school level and a district level. Um, they have weaker technological infrastructure. So for a whole wide variety of reasons, um, 
the same thing which is created, um, you know, and then distributed using what you might call a dump and hope strategy. I mean, PB works as essential strategies. We're going to build something, we're going to put it on the internet and hope that somebody picks it up. Um, get picked up really differently in, in different kinds of places that I'm only able to summarize. Um, and then actually sort of the terror that I have about this scenario um, is that PB works actually has no idea um, that this distribution is happening, but as they start collecting usage data about how, thing, how, how PB works is, is being used, um, that pair of data is really being generated primarily um, by wealthy settings. And so what you potentially develop is this really kind of terrifying feedback loop um, where we produce stuff, we pass it through the internet, we're not exactly sure who's picking it up, but it turns out that affluent students are primarily picking it up. They're the ones who's shaping the usage data that we're collecting, that usage data gets passed back to builders and we create this feedback loop um, where builders unknowingly are essentially designing for, for students in already advantaged locations. Um, that is, that's kind of my terror of education technology and, uh, um, and so forth. Um, good, I think I'm going to end right on time. So in, in the case of wikis, um, we, uh, you know, if you imagine these two stories, it, it seems pretty obvious to me that wikis, you know, sort of nurture a kind of rising tide sort of scenario um, where wikis disproportionately benefit the already affluent. I'm not saying that that's the case um, with all different kinds of OER resources and education technology interventions, although it seems to me um, that interventions that use distribution mechanisms similar to the ones of PB Works might very well have similar kinds of outcomes. Like if the, if the idea is we put this stuff out there and hope that people pick it up, um, that institutions with greater technological, social, and human capital, maybe the the ones who are more likely to pick it up. Um, so if you're at the Berkman Center, you can't just stop with the empirical data. You've got to think a little bit about what the normative and policy implications are. Um, so if you think this is true, um, and, and first of all, people should do lots of other case studies, and we should listen to the case studies this afternoon to see if it's true, um, what would you do about it? Well, one thing you could take is a sort of neutral approach. If there's more net learning, um, who's ever learning, that's a good thing. Um, it's not our responsibility that we live in an equitable society. Let's build the best learning objects we can and let's pass them out there. Another response you could have is we should actually, at this sort of vulnerable moment where we're trying to promote open policy, we should prioritize serving middle and high income learners and develop the kind of political support among those constituencies um, to get them behind the kind of work that we're doing. Um, you might not be surprised to find that my sympathies lied with a third answer, which is that education is the civil rights issue of our time. Um, and we should rethink distribution and delivery mechanisms to ensure that innovations target those who need the most support. I've had a great time um, talking to Mike from Road Trip Nation and, and how much they've been emphasizing delivering their curriculum to, to people in places like juvenile correction institutions. Um, thinking about their distribution mechanisms is not just getting it out there to anyone, but getting, developing something and distributing it to those who need it the most. Um, so that's my story um, about how looking at a particular case study um, reshapes my thinking of the OER ecosystem. Um, I personally hope that one thing that you take away from it uh, is this idea um, that it may be really useful to imagine um, profoundly inequitable school systems when we're developing our kind of overarching models of OER. But in terms of thinking about the rest of the afternoon, I hope that what we can all do is sort of take whatever model that we've been developing over the course of the morning, um, whatever conceptual framework we have, um, look at the particular case studies that we'll look at for the rest of the afternoon and see how they challenge, how they influence, how they command us to add or subtract different elements from those models. Um, so thanks a ton for your attention and hopefully that's a good provocation for the afternoon.